Leonardo DiCaprio, Robert De Niro and Lily Gladstone star in this macabre western about serial murders among the Osage tribe in 1920s Oklahoma, which reflects the erasure of Native Americans from the U.S. Martin Scorsese's western true crime thriller is about the U.S.'s Osage murders of the early 1920s, based on the nonfiction bestseller by David Grant. With co-writer Eric Roth, Scorsese, the movie director, crafts an epic of creeping, existential horror about the birth of the American century. A macabre tale of quasi-genocidal serial killings which mimic the larger erasure of Native Americans from the U.S. The movie places in the drama's foreground a gaslit marriage of lies and poison love. The movie echoes Scorsese's earlier work about mob violence, mob loyalty, and the final, inevitable sellout to the federal authorities. But in the end, Killers of the Flowers Moon movie is about what all Westerns are about, and perhaps all history of the Westerns have been, which is the brutal grab for land, resources, and power. Lily Gladstone gives a great performance of tragic force as Molly Burkar, a Native American woman from the Osage tribe who, like all her people, has become unexpectedly wealthy because the apparently stony, an unpromising land in Oklahoma on which the authorities allowed the Osage to settle turned out to have huge reserves of oil. But they are still subject to a racist and infantilizing condition of guardianship. To claim the income and spend it, Osage individuals need a white co-signatory. And further twist to the saga, Molly and her family started to develop deep sense of fear as a result of the mysterious illnesses which have been killing off Osage people, one by one. Subvently, the bodies of Osage murder victims started to show up in different degrees, including Molly's wayward sister Anna, played by Cara Jade Myers. An autopsy performed on Anna to determine cause of death were bizarrely carried out in the open air at the crime scene itself. The movie brought into the scene a slippery, venal individual called Ernest, played by Leonardo DiCaprio. Ernest is an ambitious, but also submissive and fundamentally inadequate man, who is greedy, stupid and biddable. Ernest has returned to the U.S. after service in the First World War, and he comes to the vast estate of his wealthy uncle, William Hale, played by Robert De Niro, who has offered him a job working alongside his hard-faced brother, Brian. Brian is pronounced as by Ran. Brian is played by Scott Shepard, and Brian has been extensively indoctrinated in the violence and corruption practices that the uncle presides over. Freshly back from the war, Ernest Burkhardt is in need of money, a fresh start and perhaps a young wife. His uncle, William Hale, seems very willing to furnish him with all three. It is noteworthy to know that Hale is a cattle baron and therefore already rich. William Hale is known as a cattleman plutocrat, a man of calcified resentment and self-importance who preens himself on his good relations with the Osage people. As it is with wealth, having one fortune is not enough, but having multiple seems to be an idle road to follow. With a hidden intention in mind, Hale hires Ernest for a position as his vague underling, courtier and dirty work factotum, and he encourages Ernest to date and also marry Molly, played by Lily Gladstone, whom Ernest has already met. The marriage would give Ernest, as well as Hale, a legal claim on Molly's headrights. As her oil entitlements are known, Molly holds the headrights to the oil deposits on her land. If Ernest marries Molly, then he, Ernest, and Hale promptly would gain control of the estate. Nevertheless, what Molly gets from the arrangement is more open to question. With these premeditated kinds of ideology, Ernest and Molly's doomed marriage started. Life that followed after the doomed marriage is plagued with complications and bad events. Notable complication is the terrible fears of Molly's ailing mother, Lizzie Q, played by Tantu Cardinal, who has a quietly beautiful death scene in the movie. Another notable complication is Molly's diabetes. Molly is diabetic and needs regular doses of insulin. The Dabitz is made strangely worse by the medicine Hale has procured for her, and which Ernest administers while always simpering and blubbing his concern for her declining health. When the situation becomes too bad for the federal authorities to ignore, Washington, D.C. sends an officer up its fledgling Bureau of Investigations, which later became the FBI known today. The officer FBI sent was Tom White, played by Jesse Plemons. The FBI getting involved in the Osage saga is more of a political affair. The Bureau's belated appearance in the movie appears to be, at least partly, a matter of containing the difficult situation involving the white people and the inescapably wealthy Osage peoples, hence serving as a way of reinforcing federal control over the new state of Oklahoma. As performed by Gladstone and DiCaprio, the relationship between Molly and Ernest has a kind of spiritual nausea. Ernest is sincere about his feelings for his wife, in his way, sadly. They are part of a context of bad faith, and violence. His real relationship is of course with his uncle. He is the beta to the older man's alpha. Weirdly, 
DiCaprio, as Ernest, starts to look like De Niro, as Hale, like a dog resembling its master. A younger, victim-villain version with the same gimlet-eyed fear and hostility, and the same rat-trap mouth with the corners turned down. Ernest uncle, Hale, has inducted him into the Masons. Some scenes depict the local Masonic Hall with all its regalia, where Hale leads the wretched Ernest for a corporal punishment section when the young man lets him down, the most extraordinary corporal punishment the movie showed. Although Bill Hale has dangerous intentions, but he's still avowedly caring and sensitive to the Osage, despite the vast dysfunction of depression, alcoholism, lawlessness, fatal illness and murder lingering all over the town. Molly is one of the main characters in the movie. Lily Gladstone creates a persona for Molly that is flawed and self-reproachful, with some shame at having collaborated with her persecutor. Molly has dignity and calm and rises above the squalor all around her. But that calm is also get stricken by immobility caused by illness. And she knows that Ernest was never any good but she was charmed and seduced by him all the same. Killers of the Flower Moon is a remarkable story, with an audacious framing device of a briskly insensitive true crime radio show featuring Osage characters crassly played by white actors. Killers of the Flower Moon is an utterly absorbing movie, with a story that projects or highlights secret history of American power. A hidden violence epidemic polluting the water table of humanity. How greed and corruption played out in the movie. The movie depicts some accounts of greed and corruption in several ways. Here are some of the ways this theme is portrayed in the movie scenes. Exploitation of the Osage Indian Nation The movie shows how the Osage people were exploited for their oil wealth. The white settlers around the Osage land saw the oil wealth as an opportunity to make money. Thus, they began to exploit the people. The white folks and authorities start to charge the people exorbitant rates at local businesses. They also pursued strategic marriages with tea local women so as to gain access to their wealth. Institutional Corruption the movie shows how institutional corruption allowed for the destruction of a culture that have flourished in spite of centuries of oppression. The white folks and local authorities get involved in covering up crimes, and the justice system failed to persecute the crime perpetrators and to protect the Osage people. The movie portrays how political corruption was prevalent in Pawhuska, which the movie plot used to point out the broader corruption in American politics at the time. American Entitlement the movie shows how American entitlement turned into greed. The white settlers saw the oil wealth of the Osage people and became envious of it. As a result, they wanted to take it for themselves, and this led to a series of brutal crimes against the Osage people. Toxic combination of greed, entitlement, and corruption. The movie highlighted and portrayed the fact that a toxic combination of greed, entitlement, and corruption made America and destroys America. The Osage Reign of Terror is a potent metaphor for what American greed has done to the tribe's culture, wealth, and agency. Conspiracy The movie portrays how a conspiracy was run by Hale against the Osage Nation to systematically kill them off and steal their wealth and land rights. The crimes were even more widespread, as the movie showed how the combination of financial envy and racial hatred ignited these horrible acts. The film is a sweeping epic, three and a half hours long, shot on location on the Osage Reservation in Oklahoma. The story in the movie has real evil in it, evil that showed up when the lust for money grab becomes the center of attraction, so to speak. If you are a fan of the crime story drama, you will definitely become a fan of this movie. The movie is worth going to the movie theater to watch. More. On the plains northwest of Tulsa, Oklahoma, where oil rigs outnumber the bison, lies a stain so dark it makes the crude look crystal clear. A tragically true tale of man's inhumanity to man that's hitting the big screen this week. Oh, I was uh, sent down from Washington, D.C. to see about these murders. Hmm. Huh. See, see what about him? See who's doing it. Trying to be as truthful as possible is the only way to tell these stories. This wealth 
should come to us. Oscar winners Leonardo DiCaprio, Martin Scorsese, Robert De Niro, and a relative newcomer, Lily Gladstone, teamed up with Apple Original Films to bring David Grant's best-selling book, Killers of the Flower Moon, to life. It's so simple. The front is the front, the back is the back. Man, he has to make it look like he done it himself. It just looks like murder. It's not supposed to be that way. In this case, it's not who done it, who didn't do it. Set on action. It's a sweeping epic, three and a half hours long, shot on location on the Osage Reservation in Oklahoma. Where in 2017, we joined author and journalist David Grant. We're talking about scores of murders, and we're talking about a very small population. Killers of the Flower Moon took Grant a decade to research. Each thread he pulled took him down a darker road. This is a story that has real evil in it, evil like I've never covered or ever experienced or researched about before in my life. Really? Was that dark? Yeah, yes. The Osage, they have the worst land possible. That evil showed up when the money did. The Osage land was long thought to be worthless. But they outsmarted everybody. The land had oil on it. In the 1920s, oil was discovered here, which almost overnight made the Osage among the wealthiest people per capita in the world. Money flows freely here now. I do love that money, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Like a magnet, their newfound prosperity attracted outsiders, white men, mostly, who came not just to build the Osage out of their oil money, but to inherit it. The only way you could get their money was to marry into their families and then to slowly target them. At this Osage cemetery in Greyhorse lies the evidence that entire families were wiped out, either shot, blown up, drugged, or poisoned. Ernest Burkhart wormed his way into the Osage family tree by marrying an Osage woman named Molly back in 1917. You talk too much. Their real-life love affair, as troubled as it was, is where the film begins. What was that? That's how you are. I don't know what she said, but it must have been Indian for handsome devil. <laughs> the heart of, of the entire situation you're in, love, the trust that goes with love, and then this extraordinary, extraordinary betrayal, and still loving. Now, how do we do that? The short answer, carefully. We did our absolute best to listen to the Osage community. I don't know if we did a perfect job, who knows? But they embraced us and were so incredibly helpful and so vulnerable. So this is the Osage War Shield, typical uh, of that time, that era. Uh, Principal staff, chief of uh, the Osage Nation, Jeffrey M. Standing Bear, and, uh, knows the risks of letting Hollywood different, in. Different staff. Native Americans have always had someone else tell them the story about us, but we wanted to tell our story. When we spoke with the cast and crew back in July, they were all on that same page, especially Martin Scorsese. You deal with uh, Native Americans and indigenous people, you gotta make sure everything we do, everything we do is as authentic, as accurate, or at least as reasonably accurate from what can be remembered as possible. And respectful. And respectful. They were Luke, say. So, to that end, he hired as many Osage as possible, both in front of and behind the camera. They really worked hard at this and earned our respect. You felt comfortable with the way they were going to approach it? If you're not comfortable with Marty Scorsese, <laughs> you're not going to be comfortable with anybody. I'll tell you. Point. I don't sleep anymore. DiCaprio's co-star, Lily Gladstone, has critics raving. I don't even know if you love me anymore. Why? Of course I love you. She grew up on the reservation of the Blackfeet Nation in Montana. She brought so much to not only her character, but to the entire film. She was an amazing partner to have. Oh, thanks, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> it seems like that's emotional, though, for you to hear. 
I mean, <laughs> I guess I could try to choke it down and put it somewhere else, but why? Yeah. It is. It is. It's, um, it's a big responsibility and it's terrifying. It's hard being a native actor, having this sort of, this much that you, are, you can audition for. Yeah, Marty showed me what's possible. The film called for her to speak fluent Osage. DiCaprio and De Niro had to master that language too. The language itself, how hard was that? It was, was it, it was tough. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he had he has the benefit of like I mean, you did an incredible job, and you also did an incredible job of doing it the way a white man would say it. <laughs> <laughs> That's my job. <laughs> For Hollywood trivia buffs, this is the first time that DiCaprio has worked with De Niro and Scorsese on the same film at the same time. The two of them are so incredible together. They're shorthand. The way they communicate, it's almost through sign language, it's nods, it's, it's this, it's, and I know, I know, I mean, it's, it's incredible <laughs> to watch. You said that you have sort of a shorthand with, with Robert De Niro, what do you have with Leo? Uh, a long hand. Long hand? <laughs> <laughs> with me, it's a long discussion, it's grinding things, <laughs> lots of d rehearsals. Expecting a miracle to make all this go away. You know they don't happen anymore. For David Graham, seeing all of this come together was both satisfying and to him a bit mesmerizing. My world is not in Hollywood at all. I, you know, I'm, I am a nerd 24 hours a day. We caught up with him just before the film debuted for the Osage in Tulsa back in July. <laughs> the idea that now we're standing here and there's going to be a film and more and more people are going to learn about the history, to me that is what is so powerful um, and, and, and remarkable about it to me. Gran ended his book with a conversation he recalled having with an elderly Osage woman. As she looked out across these plains, she quoted scripture. The blood cries out from the ground, she said. All these years later, Perhaps those cries will finally be heard.